Okay, so, so what I'd like to do is give you an update on the modeling side of the Small Trees High Productivity Initiative and um, with some reflections on how computational modelers and field scientists can work together to get, are working together to uh, advance the project. Remember to turn it on, whoops. Okay, the small trees, um, or the initiative is looking at um, some ideas from temperate fruit tree experience uh, to um, apply them to tropical and subtropical trees. So in apples in particular, over the last few decades, we've seen uh, a progression from really uh, large trees, whoops, large trees that are uh, widely spaced and with lots of effort needed to harvest the fruit to modern orchards with small trees that with much reduced vegetation and much higher yields per hectare. So we want to create the same kind of system for our tropical and subtropical orchards. So we've chosen to work on macadamia, um, avocado and mangoes. And the idea being that we can get these high tree numbers per hectare. Um, one of the ideas that comes from the apple work is having dwarfing rootstocks. So you graft the uh, plant onto a rootstock that controls vegetative growth. And then that can help you uh, control the, the vigor of the plant. That's a, a long, possibly long study to find those. So we may or may not get that in the course of our project, but it's one of the aims. But really what we're looking at is appropriate pruning and training systems uh, within our orchards. So this is a large project. We have DAF teams at Mariba and in Bundaberg. Mariba and Mango and Bundaberg looking at Avo and Macadamia. And we have molecular and modeling teams here at UQ. We also have international collaborations um, in a number, a number of areas. So our key research areas to try and understand what's going on with these trees are to look at the architecture. It's a really basic study, uh, but it's, it's a th something that's quite different between apple trees and um, something you might find in a rainforest, growing in a rainforest somewhere. Um, for one thing, the tree keeps its leaves. So when we're looking at apples, they drop their leaves every year. You can look at the architecture of a tree quite easily. But with our trees, they keep their leaves. And so we gotta, if we're looking at architecture, it's a much more detailed study. So that architecture then builds us a canopy that we have light moving through. And what we're gonna do is, of course, try and make these trees smaller and control them in different ways. So light distribution is, is one of the important things that we're manipulating in, in the canopy uh, by changing the architecture and managing the tree. Um, so we need to understand what's going on with that. Vigor is about how much vegetative versus reproductive growth you've got. So you saw in those apples that there wasn't a lot of vegetative growth on the, in the modern systems. Well, we want to do the same kind of thing with something that can be quite a huge tree if you've seen a <laughs> mango in the, in the wild. And of course, crop load. We need to understand uh, the trade-off between our vegetative, our, our number of leaves, and the fruit that we can manage to grow on a tree. So experimental work um, is necessarily targeted at highly controlled situations. So you've got a, a lot of, um, you need to work in highly controlled uh, areas because you've got um, so many factors that are changing with uh, what's going on. And this is compounded by the whole issue of trees where you've got huge amount of time before you get yield. Um, and so we want to try and sort, short circuit the experimental cycle a little bit by adding in our modeling efforts. 
And we can also look at how different aspects of these research areas integrate uh, with a model that's not so easy experimentally. So the, traditionally what you might have with the, you're having field experiments, you're analyzing the data, you're coming to some conclusions which lead to more hypotheses. Here's a new tree shape we want to try. Let's do some more experiments. Uh, what we're doing is adding in a computer design, uh, modeling design um, component into the mix. Uh, we're looking at the data that comes out of the literature and out of our field experiments and saying, well, what mechanisms actually run? What's going on in the trees? And then we create some models that we believe reflect those mechanisms. And then we can run some uh, computer experiments, um, have a look at the results they show. We can do lots more of these experiments um, than we can do field experiments just because, well, if we have a big enough computer, we can. Um, and we can try many different things and therefore focus the next set of field experiments. So let's have a look at a, a simple starting point from um, the modeling that, that we're doing. So this is some work that's been done by Anahita Mazani up in um, Mariba. Uh, she's been working on mangoes. And this was some of the first work she did looking at how flesh, flushes grow. Well, if we're, why is this important? If we want to know about what's going on in a canopy, we've got to know where the new leaves go and how, how big they are, what those leaves shade, and how much uh, photosynthate they're getting. So it's a sort of basic component of the a canopy that we want to get a hold on. So you can see here she's got a sequence of images of a flush growing out. Um, once uh, a at the right season of the year, we get uh, a bud growing, and it in initiates uh, a number of new primordia of the leaves uh, and in a swelling blood, bud. And then it's triggered to elongate. And you can see that all the leaves are coming out pretty much at the same time. We have basal leaves that grow quite large, and uh, the tip leaves that don't quite uh, fill out the same way. So what, this is the hard part of any kind of uh, architectural work. You've got to measure these things and see how much they grow over a time course. So she's measured these, uh, a number of these. This is just the, the graph is just a single flush. So it, it had 11 leaves. And so she's been tracking how those 11 leaves expand over time. So. We're looking at leaf length there, but in fact, that's um, a proxy for biomass. If you've got leaf length and you can relate the shape and the size to biomass through dry, mass, dry matter experiments, then you can say, or dry matter measurements, then you can say what's going on with uh, the amount of carbon that's being used in the system. So that's uh, an important point. The other one is that you notice that the x-axis is in degree days. It's not in days. Although, of course, she's measuring every second day or every third day, whatever she's chosen. Um, but what we do is keep track of the temperature at the same time, because temperature is uh, an important driving um, variable in, in growth. So if you plot this by day, if you've got a bunch of cold days, you might get a, a you know, not very much growth. Uh, and then a few hot days, suddenly elevated growth, and you get a very staircase kind of um, graph there. So what we do is use degree days to even that out because the growth is proportional to the amount of heat that you get. Um, so this is a visualization of the data and she did two different varieties, KEAT and KP. And this is an average of uh, the flushes that she was looking at. So you can see that not only did she look at um, the lengths of the leaves, she also considered color changes because uh, there's lots of different things going on in, in the leaves 
at the time. She did a, a bit of an analysis of what's going on with the colors. Um, this is re related to levels of uh, chlorophyll in the leaf and things like that and defensive chemicals. And then also you notice that there's different angles for these leaves. And this is relevant for things like light interception or may be relevant for things like light interception. Um, uh, but you can see how these guys grew over time. So we've got some models of how a flush grows. But what happens if we manage things differently? What happens if there's a fruit growing at the bottom of that flush as it's trying to grow out? What do we have to do? Well, we could go and start measuring all the different cases that we think possibly happen and we could get some empirical models. But what we really want to do is understand these mechanisms and use them to make predictions about what's going on. So, talking to our field scientists and reading the literature, um, emphasize the, the uh, importance of carbon allocation. Uh, for different questions, we need to model these things at different scales. So, um, we have local carbon pools. So, if we think about a single flush or a, a year's growth unit, um, we have uh, flushing shoots and fruit filling going on and we need to understand how they interact to uh, decide on what the ideal uh, architectures for our high density orchards are. Uh, models at a canopy scale, we used to think, address issues around um, light interception, light distribution in the canopy. So we can, um, it's a, a simpler type of model to get at that, to get to that scale. And the final one there is carbon transport resistance model at the internode and leaf scale, which is a quite detailed model. And there we're using it to address issues around which fruit is going to get dropped or which leaf gets dropped. And this is a big issue with what's going on in the tree. Um, the things that aren't there are probably as important as the things that are. So you need to know when they uh, leave the tree. So we thought, well, let's start at the beginning and make some models. So Inigo uh, Osmendi um, worked on this uh, a model of final leaf length. It's a very uh, stick-like model, as you can see. He's um, using a length 2D type representation of the leaf size, very simple, um, and just looking at how the radiation levels, uh, temperature, as we discussed with the degree days before, and then carbon allocation based on um, potential growth rates. So at a, at a certain age, then each individual leaf will have its own pen potential growth rate, and, it, and therefore its demand for carbon. And then the total leaf area at that time will de define the, the amount of photosynthate and you'll get um, an allocation proportional to uh, what you've asked for if, if there's not enough for everybody. So you can see the leaves at the bottom. Uh, we had a couple of ex existing leaves in there, but the first leaves are smaller because there's not a lot of carbon in the system yet. As they're trying to expand, there's nothing there for the, to get them going. Um, And then everybody reaches their p potential size. And so here, uh, you know, goes, looked at the model with, with uh, differing light exposures and said, oh, okay, well, we're getting reasonable kinds of action out of this model. Well, then along came John. So he's the other side of our, most of our um, modeler field scientist interface. Uh, he's the lead member in DAF for the project. And uh, he looked at our model and he, s and he thought, well, he didn't say to us right away, I only found this out later, he said, all this work and all we got is some sticks. What good is that? Well, we s started talking to him, well, you know, when, once we've got this competition working in the stick, we can get it working in sticks that are competing. We can have um, a number of things going at the same time. 
So we got playing around with this kind of model. So here we've got three shoots. We got a nice emergent property. Um, more shoots, more total biomass because we got more leaves that are actually put on by the, the more shoots, but shorter individual shoots because of that initial uh, growth uh, restriction. Well, we started playing around with this a little bit. And so, well, what happens if d things happen at different times? We tried starting of branches at uh, different times, and we got some interesting results that if we start one later than the others, then it doesn't compete as well. So John thought, well, this doesn't seem to fit with the way he was thinking. So he said, I'm going to do an experiment. So he, um, we've got this um, assumptions of our model that each growing plant part demands energy every day based on its maximum potential growth rate. If there's not sufficient energy, they're limited, based on, but in proportion to their demand. And then this ability to compete is affected by the number of plant parts growing and the timing of growth relative to other plant parts. So this is the one that he really, um, he felt it wasn't quite right the way we were thinking about it. Now we have a, a number of field studies going on. We have planting systems trials. There's lots of guard trees. He said, ah, I can use some of these guard trees and do this experiment. Right now, the guard trees are so small at this stage. Uh, it was only at the second year, I think, in the ground. And um, they weren't really affecting the other trees anyway. So um, the premise is that pruning will start everybody growing. Okay, we'll get some uh, shoot growth started. So what he's going to do is prune everything off the whole tree, prune everything except for three. I think those are the ones that are marked with the little pink ribbons there. And then in different trees, he's going to uh, start the growth at different times. Okay, so some of them he's going to, uh, well, control will just be everybody pruned. Then you get somebody that's prune, pruned a week later, uh, three days later, a week later, uh, up to a couple of weeks later, I think. And then measure the, the target shoots and see how they respond. Well, luckily for the modeling people, it sort of worked the way we <coughs> predicted it would. And it was not a, quite in the way that he thought, thought it should, actually. So we had a small delay in growth, gave us a small reduction in shoot length. So the blue line is um, or we just let them grow, let them grow um, right away. So we pruned them all and measured them. And so they were all competing in, at the same time with all the other um, shoots. Then the next line along is the, uh, a small delay in growth. So we got a small reduction in shoot length there. They started growth a little bit later. Whoops. But these guys weren't really consuming a lot yet, so they caught up rather, rather nicely. But there were so many of the other ones at the end that they didn't quite get to the same level. This one started a bit later, but already these guys are way ahead, so they're, they've got a competitive advantage, and so on for the last ones. So what we get is that um, these shoots, when we put them in uh, a group like that, do react in those kind of ways. So I think this has really had a good effect on John. It sort of convinced him that modeling might be useful. It uh, let him reflect on the way th the trees were growing <laughs> and then come up with an experiment to see what's going on. Okay, so as a result of that, Inigo is now gonna go and um, do some more experiments with, it, with their, our single shoot level work by um, defining positions for all the canopy uh, from either by measuring or by just laying it out the same way that they would when they're doing the pruning and management. So what we got is a, a structure underneath that has the um, positions where the new shoots are gonna grow. And then we can examine that particular uh, year's or flushes growth and see how they compete with each other. So it's um, 
we don't need to grow the tree from ground zero, so to speak, and figure out all the interactions that have happened over all the year. We can measure the tree, look at what it's like for this year, and now do an experiment in the computer to say, okay, well, here's if we uh, move things a different way, uh, then how that affects things. So why does this, why is it important to do this in a spatial way, like with these architectural models? Well, what's happening when we arrange our trees in a central leader is that you're getting uh, the sun travels um, across one side of the canopy and you're getting uh, shading in the other side. So what you're happening if you design things as a palmette, you're running those rows north-south. So in the morning you're getting good illum illumination on this side and in, in the afternoon on the other side. So you're changing the light distribution and therefore that's an important issue uh, to consider when you're looking at, and these models let us address that type of issue. Um, we can then start thinking about, well, what, what happens if it's growing too vigorously and we need to reduce it? Well, we could chop out some of these branches in the middle. It'll change the light environment again, change the number of fruiting points. How is that gonna affect our crop yield? Um, there's all sorts of issues around uh, light that are important. So things like uh, blush in mangoes, how much light do they get so that the, the fruit is of good saleable quality and things like that. So those are all issues that we can address with this um, fairly detailed architectural style of model. Okay, so in the meantime, we've been doing some work in our other systems. So Ming Wang was one of our uh, PhD students. He's been looking at uh, annual growth in avocado. Uh, working from the literature, uh, there's a paper by uh, Grant Thorpe in Sedgley in 93 uh, that described very well how this annual growth module worked. So that means the growth from one year. So you can see that we have uh, the yellow is the first flush. It came out of an old inflorescence. Uh, the inflorescence didn't uh, terminate with a flower, it, so it kept growing. And you get this initial flush with a uh, what's called a selectic shoot, the yellow one that grows out at the same time as the main flush is growing. You have a second flush with these um, proleptic branches uh, that are coming from the previous flush's growth. And so we're looking at how these, uh, the competition occurs in the whole growth module. So these are the kinds of models that he's making. They're two-dimensional. Um, we're assuming good light in these, these kind of cases. And um, but what we're doing is using a, what Ming is doing is using a, uh, an approach called pattern-oriented modeling that comes from uh, ecology. So here we have another inf interface. Ming has been talking with a guy named Volker Grimm who's in uh, Germany, uh, who is sort of an expert on this application of this pattern-oriented approach to creating models. And we're trying to see how that approach can help us with our um, canopy ecology, if you like. So what are a number of uh, patterns that he's matched here? So patterns such as the number of selectic shoots, the number of proleptic shoots, the lengths of, and the amount of biomass that you get out of a whole shoot. These are all things that emerge from this kind of model because we have the carbon allocation going on uh, underlying it. And he's done very well at matching um, observations that he's um, collected from the, both from the literature and from our people up at Bundaberg. Um, um, collecting uh, data on the architectural aspects of things. Okay, Neil White is, uh, has been working on um, the light models. He's been using a self-organizing model it takes a very simple light model based on shading rather than actually calculating all the light. And um, we get an accumulation of carbon flux uh, redistributed through the tree as growth flux and then enough reaches a terminal it grows out into the nearest open space. So this kind of model lets him create these kind of models of uh, 
canopies. And then we can look at light distributions. So these are actually models of the physics of light as it appears from a, from a daily uh, sky model. And um, so you can look at how different tr uh, management systems like pruning affects the light distribution at the floor of the canopy. These are macadamias. So they're uh, quite interested in not having too much going on underneath because um, that's how they collect, uh, harvest their things from the, from the ground. Um, okay, this work is now preceded. He's, he's working on uh, avocado uh, canopies with this light modeling now. Uh, some work I've been doing with um, uh, one of our international collaborators, Alice Elisnova, um, uh, it's m is at the much more detailed level. And this is proof of principle kind of work at this point. Um, what we want to do know is that the, the higher level models, that the abstract models that we're using are actually reasonable if you try and compare them against uh, a more detailed model uh, in, in the uh, phloem and xylem. So this is work uh, consistent with the Munch hypothesis, which is um, talking about uh, mass flow of, of um, carbon. And it's based on some work Holland mentioned in 2013. And we've modified that to fit into the computational models. Um, so here we're looking at uh, flow rates um, based on uh, resistances which are not possible to measure, so they have to be estimated in uh, stems from sources to sinks. And uh, considering what the water situation is and how uh, transfer of water across the semi-permeable permeable membrane between xylem and phloem uh, affects things. Um, so this gives us uh, compartmental models that um, let us estimate um, concentrations of sugar right now in just little sticks. So John's going to be asking, well, what does this mean? Uh, well, we're going to build this up with more complex structures and look at uh, how flow is affected between um, fruits and leaves on a local level. So this has got a lot to do with what's going on with the uh, dropping of fruit and who gets the upper hand in, um, in growth and so therefore affects yield. So we want to know that what we're doing at the local level um, and making more abstract models of at the higher scale are working correctly. So for future work, uh, we want to take these bunch of sticks, put them together, make some canopies out of them, um, investigate management effects, things like tying down, pruning, at a canopy scale incorporating the crop load aspects. So measurements are going on um, up at Mariba and uh, Bundaberg, looking at those kind of things. And we hope to look at uh, particularly get fruit into the scene. We haven't had done a lot with fruit yet. Um, for some of these models, we're going to need a bit more compute power. Luckily, the university here has good high performance computing um, facilities. And we're going to get, we've got Li Chi Han on board to help us with um, developing those approaches for orchard scale models. Um, we've got a big project team. Of course, we'd have to thank all of them because they're all been collecting, measuring data and measuring trees and uh, wondering why they're doing it a lot of times. I think they've, they're fairly convinced now that it's useful. So, um, And the, the initiative is an initiative, the Queensland government and uh, UQ. And um, we've got New South Wales DPI in there as well, doing a small part of the work in northern um, 
New South Wales, and we're funded through Hort Innovation um, funding. So I've got to say that the associated in industries are quite involved in all this and are closely watching what we're up to. <laughs>